Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the third lecture of my series on the selected gross pathology of the urinary tract. And we're going to talk about viral diseases, the effect of the urinary tract. The most important concept to remember when we talk about viruses and the urinary system is the fact that the kidney represents the largest vascular bed in the entire body. So most of the viruses we're going to talk about affect vessels. Before we do that, however, I've got to thank all my great friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me with these fantastic images, which allow me to put these lectures together. So let's start with a terrific image by Dr. Paul Stromberg of the, the Ohio State University, and we're looking at the kidney of a dog. It's a young dog, a puppy, probably less than 30 days, and possibly even as little as 10 days old. This is a multifocal coalescing necrohemorrhagic nephritis, which is due to one of two viruses. The first one I want to talk about is the one that affects the very young puppies less than 10 days of age, particularly because they have trouble maintaining a constant body temperature. And herpes viruses like parts of the body or animals that have a slightly lower temperature and they perform best at uh, a lower temperature. Uh, canine herpes virus type 1 is most often seen in the very young animal where it has a endotheliotropic and an epitheliotropic function. The endotheliotropic function is manifested in the necrosis and hemorrhage that we see in multiple organs around the body. Uh, the kidney is particularly hard hit because of all the blood vessels in the glomeruli and if we took a microscopic section we could see uh, rare inclusions within the endothelium of the glomeruli and in the vasa recta as well. The reason that the hemorrhage is so concentrated here, of course, is because the blood vessels are so concentrated, and you can almost imagine that the center of each of these hemorrhages are one or a group of glomeruli. Uh, you can see necrosis and hemorrhage in multiple organs in these animals, and often do, especially the kidney, the adrenal gland, uh, the liver, and the lung. In these young animals, the lung is where the virus uh, exerts this epitheliotropic effect uh, for the most part and you can see necrosis within the airways it seems like most of the necrosis is focused on the airways uh, in the lungs of these animals and that's also how the disease manifests in older animals remember that alpha herpes viruses are latent infections so the animal can be infected early in life survive or show no clinical signs but it can recrudesce later on in life when the animals immunosuppressed uh, or goes through a stressful time most of these puppies are exposed during the birth as they pass through the birth canal in a dam that uh, probably had a latent infection and due to uh, pregnancy and parturition it became uh, infectious and that's how these puppies pick it up in older animals it tends to be primarily focused on uh, the uh, the airways in the lung there was a, a several recent papers uh, on uh, both canine herpes virus 1 and feline herpes virus type 1 uh, very similar alpha herpes viruses in which the focus is on the epithelium, the airways, but I've seen a number of these cases in adult animals and, and you can find uh, necrosis and hemorrhage in multiple organs. I always like the adrenal gland for herpes viral infections. The adult animals don't, don't manifest this amount of hemorrhage in the kidneys. Now if we look at somewhat older puppies, maybe up to 30 days of age, I'm going to add canine adenovirus type 1 to my differential diagnosis. Uh, this is also an endotheliotropic virus which has a couple of other tropisms. It will also affect uh, the proximal renal convoluted tubular epithelium in the kidney that usually doesn't lend itself to uh, uh, a very good gross lesion and as the name infectious canine hepatitis uh, would suggest uh, the 
K9 adenovirus type 1 also has a profound tropism for hepatocytes, uh, often causing significant necrosis, which in itself can contribute to hemorrhages around the body because the liver is where a lot of the coagulation factors are made. Uh, animals affected with canine adenovirus tend to have more diffuse and more severe hemorrhages overall than animals with canine herpes virus although I don't think that that's something that you can hang your hat on. Um, but they do also have a very unique uh, lesion which I've never seen in any other animal uh, or any other dog, and that is uh, hemorrhage within the brainstem. That seems to be the province of canine adenovirus. Most people don't because they're presented with an animal with obvious lesions. Uh, the chest and abdomen, they may not harvest the brain stem, but it's a great lesion if you see it for canine adenovirus type 1. Now, acute necrotizing vascular lesions aren't the only way that viruses damage the kidney. A number of other viruses, and a couple more that we'll look at over the course of this lecture, do it in a more chronic more insidious way. These are viruses that do not kill animals outright. They remain as, as chronic infections uh, due to viruses that cannot be cleared. And so the body is going to make antibodies in large numbers, non-neutralizing antibodies, which eventually are going to reach a stage where they're going to complex with the antigen and they get to a, a critical point where they begin to start precipitating out of the blood blood and go into the walls of blood vessels. A classic disease and a classic lesion uh, in the kidney of affected cats is that caused by the mutated feline coronavirus that causes a disease known as FIP or feline infectious peritonitis. That particular virus is normally an innocuous virus that lives in the intestine of cats, but in certain individuals that virus has a genetic mutation which allows it to survive within macrophages which normally kill and clear that virus. And so the animal now has a chronic infection. It is making antibodies against it. And it's going to reach that tipping point where they begin to precipitate in uh, basement membranes of vessels all over the body. Uh, in cats, you can see this lesion in a wide range of organs, and because it infects macrophages, it's taken all over the body. Uh, we can see variants of the disease in which the vascular lesion is very prominent. Um, these animals may have effusions, especially high protein uh, effusions in the abdominal cavity, and that's how the disease gets its name, feline infectious peritonitis. Uh, it makes for a great lesion. This one is on the surface of the kidneys. We could certainly see it on the cut surface as well. But one of the keys is that this is a true vasculitis. My morphologic diagnosis for this would be a multifocal coalescing uh, lymphoplasmacytic renal vasculitis with nephritis. In FIP, I always emphasize the vasculitis first because that's where you will see the lesion. On cut section, you will see that the inflammatory lesions, which are composed of a variety of uh, inflammatory cells. I like to say no two cases of FIP are alike. Some will be lymphoplasmacytic, some will be lymphohistocytic, some will be granulomatous. Uh, but they always track the vessels, usually have a lot of uh, inflammatory cells in the walls and around the vessels as well as uh, fibrin and evidence of vasculitis. So emphasize the vasculitis. If it's in the liver, it's going to be a, a vasculitis. If it's in the lung, it's going to be a vasculitis first with the inflammation spreading secondarily into the adjacent tissue. Um, this is a great lesion. The other rule out for something like this would probably be feline uh, lymphoma because they can look a, a lot alike. They are both sort of white nodules. 
but the FIP lesions, as we see, are tracking these vessels. There are true vasculitis where uh, nodules of malignant lymphoma tend to be more random and they don't care so much about the vessels. Later on in these lectures, when we talk about fungal agents, I can show you a, a very similar kidney. So I put that in my differential diagnosis for this, but way down in the, uh, in the differential diagnosis. So we've looked at acute necrotizing lesions of vessels. We've looked at some chronic uh, lesions of vessels. And we're going to talk about another form that that takes. And here's another unique uh, way that uh, a virus can affect the renal vasculature. Uh, this is the kidney from a bison. And if you take a good look, that you'll see that around all the glomeruli, and I can tell you around the vessels at the corticomedullary junction there, the walls of these are all expanded. They're also uh, infiltrated by inflammatory cells. But these are a proliferating population of lymphocytes. This is a multifocal coalescing or a diffuse uh, lymphocytic renal vasculitis, which is due to another type of herpes virus, a radenovirus, which used to be called gamma herpes virus, uh, which causes in ruminants a disease known as malignant catarrhal fever. Now, this gamma herpes virus, when it's in its natural host, and, and most ruminants, or at least a lot of ruminants, with the exception of cattle, have their own specific uh, brand of this virus, a strain of this virus. In sheep, uh, it's called ovine herpes virus type 2, but there are forms in wildebeest and white-tailed deer and goats and a lot of other ruminants. In the natural host, as any type of herpes virus is, the, the natural disease is latent, it is often subclinical, and it doesn't cause any problem. A lot of flocks of sheep in this country have this endemic. They have the agent, unless they're severely immunosuppressed, they have a whopping, they end up with a, a whopping load of this. You never see any signs. But other ruminants that are pastured with them or in close contact, perhaps in a sale barn, um, will come down with the disease. And, and probably this bison either was in a sale barn or maybe grazed the same pasture that someone was running their sheep out on, or maybe it was white-tailed deer. And we know from a lot of diseases and a lot of lectures, boy, when herpes viruses, either the alpha herpes virus who cause necrosis like we saw in the dog kidney or the gamma herpes viruses which cause a lymphoproliferation in a number of animal species uh, including non-human primates, human primates with the uh, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, rabbits for example and now ruminants. It causes this uh, either overt uh, neoplastic transformation of lymphocytes or in the case of malignant catarrhal fever uh, more of a, a a lymphoproliferative disease but MCF is unique in that it targets the vasculature in a number of organs those lymphocytes hone in on the vessels in the GI tract it will cause vasculitis as well and coagulative necrosis of the overlying mucosa so it causes an ulcerative disease in the eye it will cause an anterior uveitis and you get this very cloudy cornea and in the kidney uh, it can cause coagulative necrosis as it causes thrombosis of affected vessels. So this is malignant catarrhal fever, a lymphocytic vasculitis or lymphoblastic vasculitis um, of ruminants. Okay. We're looking at a pig kidney. I like kidneys. I, I've said this before because you can almost always tell what kind of species you're dealing with unless it's a bison, which is sort of a, a weird species I don't work with too much. But we, we can tell this is a pig kidney because it, it's almost like a shoebox shape or, or long and oval. And um, the thing that I want you to see on this are, are two things I think you can discern on gross appearance. One are the, the numerous innumerable, if you want, petechia 
on the uh, the surface of the kidney. Well, the other thing is, if you look at this, it looks soft. It looks a little swollen. There's a little bit of fluid accumulation. So you can imagine opening the capsule of this and fluid and the tissue will bulge outward, which is strongly suggestive of, of an acute lesion. But the most important thing is to recognize these hemorrhages on the surface and to recognize that this so-called turkey egg kidney is a very non-specific finding in pigs. It is the end product of a number of viruses, three of which we're going to talk about in a minute. You can also see it in several bacterial infections, including the host-adapted uh, bacteria or the host adapted salmonella, salmonella cholera suis, salmonella typhus suis. You can also see it in uh, uh, Erysipelothrix rusiopathi and a couple of other bacteria. So it's a non specific lesion, and like so many of the swine diseases, it's a lesion that you end up with a long laundry list of possibilities. And so context becomes very important, and especially today where we have continuing outbreaks of viral disease in pigs and some very uh, severe ones, including uh, porcine pestivirus and porcine ASFAR virus, which causes African swine fever. Um, these are things which we should always be cognizant of. This particular case is a case from uh, Plum Island uh, a number of years ago. Excuse me, and now this, I got this one from Noah's Archive, and this one actually was from uh, uh, Auburn University. So we do have it occasionally. It Hog cholera, or classical swine fever, is a disease that actually started in the United States, in Missouri. So we do have it uh, from time to time. And it is a primary vasculitis. Uh, this particular agent infects, infects macrophages. And we've talked about how that's a great way to go all over the body. And uh, it does affect endothelial cells that is endotheliotropic and on top of that you know you have the do you have the necrosis of endothelial cells which causes thrombosis you have all of the cytokines which are produced by these activated virally activated macrophages which contribute to the problem and on that is not enough uh, classical swine fever will also infect megakaryocytes uh, causing a consumptive co coagulopathy as the number of platelets in the face of this vasculitis drops precipitously and the body can't replace anymore. So it's a, a classic cause of hemorrhage uh, in swine uh, in addition to some of the other lesions that it will cause. Now another important concept and, and I probably should have mentioned it earlier but we're talking about viruses and not every strain of each of these viruses is going to be especially potent. The ones that are very potent are going to kill large numbers of animals quickly. The ones that are not, and there are quite a few strains, they're often used in laboratories to study these these particular diseases, uh, they often will not kill the animals outright but it will cause a chronic disease. And one of the other uh, forms that you can see in these chronic diseases is the uh, the uh, antigen antibody response resulting in uh, a chronic antigenemia and glomerulonephritis. I like to think that the, the swine uh, the swine fever viruses tend to be a little more acute. They cause more damage. Um, but certainly we're going to look at, at one other virus in just a moment, which takes a, a often a, a somewhat different route. So we have all of these hemorrhages. We had hemorrhages throughout the body of this animal. Um, and here's another case. Um, and once again, another picture from Plum Island. The renal petechia, and it's sort of tough to tell because the capsule's not been taken off, but there is a petechiation. Um, and this is a case of a virus that causes a very similar lesions known as African swine fever or, or an ASFAR virus. Um, context is important. The two lesions can be very identical and I tend, when I think of one, I always think of the other disease in my head and they will be irrevocably linked because I've been burned enough times on cases like this. One of the things that I like for African swine fever is the uh, the lymphadenomegaly and the hemorrhage uh, that you often see 
in the lymph nodes uh, and the spleen of animals with African swine fever. Uh, animals with African swine fever tend to have significant splenomegaly. The entire spleen is big, dilated, and very congested. Whereas in many cases of hog cholera, it tends not to uh, be engorged like that, but you will have uh, infarcts and focal areas of hemorrhage, usually around the margin of the spleen. Nice to have uh, those particular lesions, but I always just say hot cholera or African swine fever because you, if you get too absolutely tied in on, on one lesion, because there's so few pathognomonic lesions, you can get burned a lot. And if the other lesion here wasn't very much, here's here's a, a more uh, long-standing case. Uh, this animal has a tremendous amount of hemorrhage. And this is, African swine fever is also one that if you have, as I said before, you if, if you have a, a strain that's not particularly pathogenic, it'll hang around the body. And then antigenemia will eventually take out the kidneys due to uh, glomerulonephritis deposition of antigen antibody complexes in that glomeruli and the problem is when you put that four material in the basement membrane it becomes extremely porous to uh, uh, substances that normally are retained uh, and you get a lot of protein that goes out. We see this in chronic antigenemias, and we're going to talk about this more as the lectures go along. We see this in chronic antigenemias of any species with a prolonged inflammatory or infectious disease. And I wanted to mention one uh, one more virus here in pigs that will give us this classic turkey egg kidney with a lot of uh, hemorrhages across the cortex. And this is a virus that has been very common and, and, and we, we are only probably still scratching the surface of the many things that it does. This is porcine circovirus. Um, and one of the major ways that it causes disease is by causing vasculitis. Uh, you can have a range of acute necrosis, uh, acute vasculitis and necrosis thrombosis and necrosis of vessels. Uh, the kidney is often paired with the skin where you'll have hemorrhages and necrosis in the dermal vessels uh, and hemorrhage and necrosis in the glomeruli uh, together. This is known as porcine dermatitis and nephritis syndrome, probably one of the earliest variants of porcine circovirus associated diseases. Uh, it can also uh, with uh, viruses that are not as pathogenic uh, cause a chronic glomerulonephritis. It really does like to cause vasculitis. Uh, there are a number of other syndromes in which it causes vasculitis, including uh, cerebellar hemorrhages. It can cause hemorrhage and necrosis of skeletal muscle. So there's a lot of variants, but uh, uh, the classic with skin and kidney lesions is, is well known. I do because you know this is such an uncommon lesion, I always look for context. We saw it earlier in the hemorrhagic uh, lymph nodes of the animal with African swine fever, and the lymph nodes in this particular animal is they're very large. They're large. They're tan. If we looked at this animal, we might see enlarged tan lymph nodes in other parts of the body. One of the things that porcine circovirus 2 does very well is cause vasculitis. The other thing that it does very well is causes tremendous infection of macrophages which not only allow it to go all around the body and infect a variety of organs but also the proliferation of macrophages um, results in what looks like true granulomatous inflammation in lymph nodes. There are so many macrophages in these lymph nodes, you're hard pressed to find pre-existing lymphoid tissue. So the fact that these lymph nodes here are so large makes me want to think uh, a little more strongly about porcine circovirus. But it's a great lesion and remember it's usually paired up with uh, uh, skin lesions. Here's another case and I, I like this one because 
this one turned out to be porcine circovirus, but it could just as easily be leptospirosis, a disease we're going to talk about in the next lecture, one that, uh, you know, just has this sort of mottled appearance. Not a whole lot of... Uh, uh, of hemorrhage here and I think that if we were to incise this kidney we would see a tremendous number of macrophages uh, in which sometimes if you get really lucky you can see the beautiful botryoid inclusions of porcine circovirus. Um, and then I'm going to finish this lecture not with a kidney but with the urinary bladder and this could be a very nonspecific lesion in a number of animal species or sort of this proliferation and hemorrhage, but if I tell you it's a bison, uh, I want you to just hone in on the fact that uh, uh, they are so sensitive to malignant catarrhal fever. And this is a great picture by Dr. Donald O'Toole, who has probably looked at more of these cases in bison than anyone else and will maintain that even if this animal is autolytic and it's been dead for, for several days, this lesion will persist. And he believes it is pathognomonic for malignant catarrhal fever in bison. So a great lesion, especially if you post a lot of bison. And with that, that brings us this particular lecture to a close. Uh, this is the second time I have recorded this lecture today. It happens to be Friday the 13th, and in the year 2020, having to re-record a lecture, if that's the worst that happens today, I'm perfectly okay with it. I enjoy doing this. I hope that you enjoy listening to them. Our next lecture, or maybe two, uh, are going to be on bacterial diseases. Got a weekend coming up, so hopefully I can knock those both out tomorrow. And uh, with that, I'm going to wish everybody a happy Friday the 13th. I wish you good luck. Go find a black cat and hug them. That will give you good luck. And I wish you good health. I hope that everybody is being safe, and I'll see you next time.